بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمات نصح الأمة فصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Welcome back uh, to the third lesson on our topic of Hakimiyyah which is obviously a subtopic within the greater topic of the methodology of Ahl Sunnah al-Jama'ah which we are discussing um, Al-Hakimiyyah uh, obviously we covered this, the relevant section in the work of the Shaykh Al-Sirat and obviously after that he goes on to the, the other topic of Tawheed al asmai wa Sifat But before we finish the topic of Al-Hakimiyyah I thought it would be relevant to go a bit deeper into this issue because it is a controversial issue it is an issue which uh, affects us all it has been affecting us uh, for a very long time it's something that you know has proved to be a very controversial topic which has caused many division caused a lot of confusion so it is only fair that we give this topic its due right and spend a considerable amount of time to uh, understanding this topic thoroughly and refuting any misconceptions concerning uh, the subject of al hakimiyyah Now, the reason why there is so much emphasis on al hakimiyyah the reason why this shaykh, for instance, he categorizes the Wahid into I think five, six, seven. He mentioned, and one of them was Hakimiyyah. He singled out Hakimiyyah, and many other scholars who also singled out al Hakimiyyah. The reason why there is so much emphasis on it is due to a number of reasons. Number one, this is a sort of fitna that this ummah is facing in this era, which on such a large scale, on which we've never faced this before. So it was never a case where a certain Muslim country in the past laid its claim on being an Islamic state, being a Khilafah at the same time uh, it did away with the Sharia of Allah and, and people just made up their own laws it was never the case in Islamic history at all on, except with one exception which was the case of the Tatar when the Tatar, the Mongols invaded Baghdad uh, and, and not, sorry, not Baghdad, sorry when the Mongols invaded um, uh, Damascus in particular at the time of Shaykh Islam and Taymiyyah rahimahullah and what they did is that they embraced Islam officially formally called themselves Muslims they said that you know we say la ilaha illallah we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the only Lord as the only uh, Allah as the only Rabb worthy of our worship and obviously they, they even had Muslim names and they adhered to many of the Muslim rituals of praying and fasting and so on however what they didn't do was to adhere to the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they had a book that was given to them by their, uh, their father or the forefather uh, Genghis Khan who basically formulated a book on laws uh, called Yasak or Yasa which was a combination of laws taken from Judaism, Christianity, Islam and many of his stuff was basically his own and that was unprecedented in Islamic history where you have a group of people who call themselves Muslims who say the Shahadatain who pray five times a day and fast and the rest of it however they are secularists in a sense that they have their own laws parallel to Islam they do not refer to Islam for judgment and ruling so that was an unprecedented case in Islamic history due to which there was a lot of confusion amongst the Muslims Alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Sorry <laughs> I just thought you just came in and said Assalamu alaikum <laughs> I get so used to people walking into the masjid Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum as salam Ya alhamdulillah So um, that was something completely unprecedented. So Muslims were naturally confused. 
They don't know what to do, how to treat these people who say La ilaha illallah on the one hand and pray in fast, they claim to be Muslims. Yeah, on the other hand, you know, they fight Muslims, kill Muslims, uh, they do away with the Sharia. Uh, you cannot, you know, the, if a person, for instance, over there in their law, if a person lies, cheats, steals or whatever, you know, he's, uh, uh, he's killed, he's executed. Their laws were really, really harsh. In terms of inheritance, everything else, everything was basically pretty much different. And it was a dilemma for the Muslims. So Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah, he wrote many fatwas to clear up that confusion, saying that anybody, as a matter of principle, anyone who refuses, or any group, any, I'm not talking about individuals here, but any group of people who get together, and they refuse to abide by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that they are to be fought. And he further argued that they are also not considered Muslims for uh, not ruling by the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was the first time it ever happened in history. And then after that, the Tatar the, the, the were defeated and the rule of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came back into the lives of the Muslims uh, until bef- before the fall of Khilafah. That's when the Ottomans they started introducing some of the European laws and started changing the laws of Islam in order to appease the European uh, powers of the time and of course in order to you know bring Islamic values in line with Western post enlightenment values so they started changing for instance the, the law of apostasy because you know that wasn't considered uh, you know very civil in Europe to kill a person for the sake of religion. It wasn't simple. So that's something they changed. That was before the fall of Khilafah, by the way. And then eventually, the Khilafah itself fell, and the rest of the Muslims, uh, you know, Muslim countries that were at the time colonized by either the British or the French or uh, the Spanish, all these countries, they fought against the, the, the colonizers, not on the basis of Islam, but on the basis of nationalism. So the struggle that was going on in India and Pakistan, the motto of which, or the slogan of which was La ilaha illallah, the basis of that struggle even, predominantly, when it comes to like most of the movements in that time that were playing a major role in the independence movement, the basis of those movements, the ideological basis was nationalism, and not Islam. Which is why, when the British left, they kept the same tradition, the same law which the British were ruling over Pakistan. And the same happened in the rest of the countries. The same happened in Egypt, the same happened in the rest of the country. So the, the, the colonialists, they left the country, the imperialists, they left the country, and then the people who occupied their place were basically colonialists, but from amongst ourselves. The same sort of mindset, except that they were a bit worse, obviously, because these colonialists, they showed more sense of mercy towards the subjects. These people are completely ruthless, which is why they got such a strong hold over uh, authority in so many Muslim countries. So the point is that this was the first time the Muslim Ummah experienced such, on such a wide scale, basically ruling with laws other than the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where Sharia no longer plays any part in a uh, life of a Muslim. Okay? Especially criminal law. As far as criminal law is concerned, the Sharia has nothing to do with it. And of course, there was like a huge pressure from European countries upon Muslim countries to embrace Western values, a Western understanding of equality, Western understanding of justice, and so on. From that perspective, you had many Muslims in Egypt and other countries calling for equality in inheritance law, arguing that Muslim uh, that uh, that the women should get the same as the men. He did say salam. Yeah. Alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya rahmatullahi wa So, so what happened obviously at that time, you know, they, uh, in order to compete with the Europeans, they tried to argue a case for Europeanized Islam or Europeanized law where inheritance law treats men and women equally 
uh, in, when it comes to, for instance, especially inheritance, uh, inheritance of um, you know, a brother and a sister. Obviously, a sister gets half of what the brother gets. But according to them, it was injustice. So they try to do away with the Sharia law and retain the European law which the, co- the colonialists were ruling that country with. And that's what happened in most of the countries. Unprecedented situation. So obviously, that gave rise to uh, this idea of Hakimiya, what happened to it, is something once we all had, once we all enjoyed, we lived, it's a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but sometimes and often in case, uh, in fact, you do not recognize the ni'mah which you're living until it goes. And so, and so it, was ne- it was never like a topic of controversy amongst Muslims, historically, the issue of Hakimiya. It obviously became a controversial topic when there was no Hakimiya in the Muslim land, there's a vacuum and there were obviously questions and hence it became a controversial topic from the moment when the Sharia was completely uh, taken out of the lives of the Muslims in Muslim countries. So that was one con- reason for controversy. Go ahead. So, uh, when would the country be considered not living under Sharia? So let's just say, for example, there's a country there, applying Sharia, like, in what case would it cease? Allah Alam, I don't know about what is the threshold, but uh, you know, I mean, many scholars I've read, they actually say that where the rule of Islam is dominant, they use very sort of general phrase to describe Darul Islam, where the rules of Islam are dominant, which could include a country where most of the rules are Islamic rules, most of the laws are Islamic laws. But in one or two instances, for, uh, for example, uh, they are not Islamic. So where there is dominance to the laws of Islam according to these scholars, then that is an Islamic country, Islamic state. Um, I've also heard um, a sheikh, one sheikh commenting that uh, when Abu Bakr al-Jazai said he doesn't know any uh, Muslim country uh, such as you know, uh, Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. or 90%, applying 90% or yeah. 90% of Islam, and, and you know, uh, that Sheikh was complaining about that. You can't really say 90% of Islam. And you say just, you know, Islamic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we don't, this is not, you can't actually, there's no threshold as such to say, okay, this, if, if, you know, if, ni- if, if the rule of Sharia is 90%, 99% then Islamic, if, it, if it's less than that, then it's not. Uh, but often you can tell, by looking at countries, often you can tell uh, how much role Islam has to play in the legislation. Sometimes you just have to look at the constitution, and it, it, it speaks for itself. Uh, such as, you know, Islam is one of the sources of law. That itself is kufr. And that is part of the constitution of many countries, many Muslim countries. You know, making Islam as only one of the sources of law. Whereas Islam isn't one of the sources of law, it is the only source of law. Um, but that's a, another discussion, inshallah. So, so there was controver- a controversy and confusion due to this reason. And then, uh, in reaction to that, obviously you had many Islamic m- movements... Uh, we saw the rise of them in India and Pakistan, in Egypt and other countries struggling to bring the rule of Islam back into the lives of the people. Uh, that includes, for instance, uh, you know, the Islamic movement in um, Pakistan and India. That includes uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which obviously spread into other parts of the Muslim area. So obviously the one of the main concerns for these groups were to tackle the main problem of today, which is to do with the Hakimiyah. It became the main problem, which is understandable. It's not, some, it's not something you can blame them for. You can't blame them for tackling an issue which is a major issue today. You can't just say, oh, these guys are obsessed with Hakimiyah. Well, they are obsessed because that is a major issue. And if people think otherwise, then they've got their priorities upside down. And that's something obviously that leads to another point, the point I wanted to make is that after that you had many people with secularist mindset. They're not secularists ideologically, 
but they have secularist mindsets and you find these people every year, you find them in the mosque, you find them on the street, most of the non-practicing people. When you ask them, brother, you know, why do you come to the mosque and say, you know, Iman is in the heart. I believe in Allah and I seek uh, 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 forgiveness from Him and as long as I do that, inshallah I die upon La ilaha illallah, I die a Muslim. So don't judge me, don't criticize me. This sort of attitude is prevailing among so many Muslims. They think that as long as they say La ilaha illallah, doesn't matter what they eat, doesn't matter where they sleep, doesn't matter what they do with their money, doesn't matter who they oppress, anything. So long as they say La ilaha illallah, they are guaranteed paradise. So this sort of secularist attitude, which became prevalent amongst the people, and also became prevalent amongst some of those who are actually religious, religious people. Uh, and these sort of people, you find them uh, sort of more inclining more towards like spiritualism, Sufism, or many of the Salafis. So for instance, Jamaat al-Tabliq was one group whose agenda was very, very you know, apolitical, very secular, in the sense that they don't actually promote secularism, but calling the people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone in terms of legislation and ruling wasn't exactly part and parcel of their da'wah. Because if it was, they would be a very controversial group. And one of the reasons why they were able to spread far and wide is because they're not con- controversial. They try to st- steer away from any sort of controversies. Um, as they can, so uh, which is the reason, obviously, that they, they have managed to far uh, spread far and wide. Salafis, for instance, if you remember that you had, I mean, uh, you know, when you say the word Salafi, it, you, you include so many different people uh, under that umbrella that it's difficult to paint them all with one brush. But generally, the Salafi movement was something that uh, that was marred with this understanding that Hakimiya is just sloganeering invented by Islamist movement in the world whose only agenda is to topple the governments, whose only agenda is basically political. They're not really sincere about Tawheed, because if they were sincere about Tawheed, then they will also do away with the Madahib, they will also do away with the four schools of law. So for them, for them, Hakimiyyah was, or Hakimiyyah, or lack thereof, was equivalent to a person following a Hanafi madhab instead of following a hadith. So when they saw the Islamists, for instance, they quoting uh, Ibn Baz, they quoting Shamkipi, they quoting other great scholars of the era who spoke about this controversial issue and declared it to be kufr. He said, whoever rules by laws other than laws of Allah is guilty of major kufr, is beyond the pale of Islam. When they use these words, the Salafis on the other hand, they came and said, well, you know, this is only kufr dun kufr. Kufr of a lesser degree. Just like sinning, like cheating, like lying. And who doesn't lie? And who doesn't cheat? So a person, for them, a ruler who rules with laws other than the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just, you know, just replaces the sharia altogether. If something else, he's, he's only sinning. That was their argument. And they obviously belittled the entire topic of Hakimiyyah altogether, such that it became like, uh, you know, according to them, it became like a sign of a mubtadi'ah. So if a person is speaking about Hakimiyyah, then it's someone you have to be aware of. Someone you shouldn't go near. Someone who's probably affected with suluri, qutubi, da'wah, and so on and so forth. And obviously they attributed all of that to Sayyid Qutub. That he was the one who invented this idea of Hakimiyyah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They always belittled the importance of this topic. They always treat it as either just a fiqhi topic, you know, you can disagree over it. Or a topic which is not, you know, just a waste of time, controversial topic, you know, just talking about politics and religion has nothing to do with it. They always say to you, you know, gain beneficial knowledge. Gain beneficial knowledge. As if Hakimiyyah is not from beneficial knowledge. And this is something, you know, the, this movement, the Salafi movement, downplaying the role of Hakimiyyah in terms of Aqidah, was something highlighted by the committee of senior scholars in Saudi Arabia when they wrote a fatwa against Ali Hassan Halabi, one of their figureheads, uh, you know, in this country, who comes to this country, obviously, gives, giving talks and lectures. He's based in Jordan. Um, 
And one of the allegations which the senior committee of scholars in Saudi Arabia leveled against him is that he belittled the topic of Hakimiyya. That's something when we study that fatwa, we're going to read that fatwa towards the end as well. That is the icing on the cake, inshallah. But as we study that, we'll see how they level this accusation of belittling the concept, the whole concept of Tawheed al Hakimiyya. And this is what this movement was geared towards. Obviously, and we're talking about a spectrum of people here with respect to al Hakimiyya. Today, we have seen a rise of secularists. Open, clear-cut secularists within, from within Muslim community. People who bear Muslim names, people who even had Islamist past. They're actually coming out in the open saying, we are secularists. And Hakimiyya is a notion first invented by either Sayyid Qutb or Maududi. Traditional Islam has absolutely nothing to do with this whole notion of law uh, you know, and governance. And legislation being the sole right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of those movements is... Quilliam. It's not a movement at all. Sorry. It's not a move. It's just... It's just a committee of... Uh, you know, scamsters at the end of the day. Who is just uh, taking lots and lots of money from the taxpayers' money. So, Quilliam Foundation. Uh, you have a guy obviously called Ed Hussein. He, he wrote this book called The Islamist. About his past with Umar Bakri and HT and so on and so forth. And how he repented from Islamism. His version of Islam is basically that it's just a religion. To him, Islam is just a religion. Just like Judaism and Christianity. And it should not, ha- it should not interfere in the political or social uh, uh, spectrum of human life. That is his view. And of course, he thinks that the whole idea about Hakimiyya belonging to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, the right of legislation, all of that is something that was invented by Sayyid Qutb and Maududi, but traditional Islam has nothing to do with it. The same sort of thing obviously is parroted by his friend Majid Nawaz, who was also part of Hizb al-Tahrir, but he you know, did the 180 degrees turn. Uh, U-turn, and uh, he started promoting his secularist ideas, and he's also part of the same movement. The same thing happened when, when the Quilliam Foundation, when they actually launched their foundation, you had a former Islamist, or as he describes himself, uh, you know, or Salafi, uh, you know, coming up and obviously giving a lecture, condoning that organization and openly declaring himself to be a secularist as well. And that's namely Osama Hassan. He's the one who translated Sifat Salat al-Nabi, the Prophet's prayer described. For the Salafi audience of this country, most of the people, you know, they learn how where to put their hands by reading uh, the book, which was translated by this guy. So he, at the end, he flipped and he became a secularist. And now their argument is basically to the extreme. There's, they are secularist extremists. Their argument is that, and I quote uh, him verbatim, uh, what's his name, Majid Nawaz, that he. Rather, his accusation against Islam is that these people claim that God has the exclusive right to legislation. Implying that in traditional Islam, God doesn't have the right to legislate. Islam is like any other religion which doesn't interfere in people's uh, social life, people's political life and so on. So, what we're going to do today, inshallah, in order to refute all these notions... We're going to read a few excerpts from this book, which we said we're going to go through, inshallah. This book is called Al-Hukum bi Ghirim Anzallah. Ahwaluhu wa ahkamuhu. Ruling by laws other than the laws of Allah. It's conditioned, the different forms it takes place in, and the ruling with respect to all these forms. And it is written by uh, one of the scholars in Saudi Arabia. His name is Sheikh Abdul Rahman Al-Mahmud. And uh, we had mentioned his name previously as well. He's the author of Mawqif ibn Taymir min al Ashaira is one of the celebrated works on the, the stance of Ibn Taymiyyah with respect to Ashaira, their opinions and so on and so forth. One of the celebrated authors of Saudi Arabia. So, he wrote this book, Al-Hukum bi Ghirim Anzallah, Ahwalhu Ahkamu, one of the most comprehensive books on this topic. And uh, what we're going to do first is 
mention some of the verses and some of the incidents and uh, in the in the history of Islam and the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and some of the sayings of the scholars as to what they say about the importance of this issue. Is this issue of hakimiyah, is it just a fiqhi issue? Or is it an aqidah issue? Is it an issue of permissible difference of opinion? Is it an issue of just sunnah and bid'ah? Is it an issue very similar to you know, following or not following the, following the four madhahib? Or is it something deeper than that and something to do with iman and kufr? Something to do with aqidah? Something to do with shahad, a person shahada la ilaha illallah. Something as basic, as fundamental as that. And this is what we're going to do today, inshallah. So hopefully within the next couple of weeks, uh, we're going to cover all of that. So, firstly, how is al-hakimiyah linked to ibadah? Tawheed al-ibadah. How is al-hakimiyah, tawheed al-hakimiyah linked to tawheed al-ibadah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in... Uh, Surah Yusuf مَا تَعْبُدُونَ مِن دُونِهِ إِلَّا أَسْمَاءً سَمَّيْتُمُوهَا أَنْتُمْ وَأَبَاؤُكُمْ So Yusuf is saying to the people You do not worship anyone apart from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Except names which you have uh, made up and your forefathers مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ بِهَا مِن سُلْطَانِ Which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't revealed from his authority إِنِ الْحُكْمُ إِلَّا لِلَّهِ حُكُمْ Belongs only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Hukum meaning ruling, law or legislation Belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Amara alla ta'budu illa iya. He has ordered that you do not worship anyone except him So look at the context here He's talking about ibadah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about ibadah One may think what's al-hukum going to do with ibadah Well that's the thing Allah is linking between al-hukum and ibadah in one verse as if there is no difference between the two surah yusuf uh, verse 40 so in al-hukum illa lillah the ruling only belongs to allah amara alla ta'budu illa iya and he's ordered that you do not worship anyone except allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if al-hukum is ibadah dhalika ad-din al-qayyim and this is the upright religion. وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ But most of the people do not know. He also says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in Surah Tawbah, اِتَّخَذُوا أَحْبَارَهُمْ وَرُهْبَانَهُمْ أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَالْمَسِيحَ بْنَ مَرْيَمُ وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا إِلَاهًا وَاحِدًا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ سُبْحَانَهُ عَمَّا يُشْرِكُونَ that they, I mean the Jews and the Christians, they took their, their priests and their, rab, or their, they took their rabbis and their monks as lords besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They took their priests and their monks as lords, or their, rather rabbis and their monks as lords besides Allah. When one of his companions, he heard this, who was formerly a Christian, he came to the Prophet sallallahu and said, we never used to worship them. Fine, we had these rabbis and we had these monks, but we never used to worship them. So what is this verse talking about? اتخذوا أحبارهم ورهبانهم أرباب من دون الله والمسيح من مريم وما أمروا إلا ليعبدوا إله واحدة that they were only ordered to worship one God, yet these people took their rabbis and monks as lords beside Allah. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said in response, did they not make the rabbis and the monks, did they not make that which was halal, haram for you, and that which was haram, halal for you, and you followed them in that, and said that is right. They did that. Meaning, what, what does it mean? Halal, changing something halal into haram, or haram into halal, that is legislation. Legislation, is the process of legalizing something or forbidding something, prohibiting something. That is in Arabic translated as halal and haram. So if a person says such and such thing is halal, he is legalizing it. If a person says such and such thing is haram, 
he is prohibiting it. That is legislation. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said to him, isn't that the case? That they used to call that which is halal, haram. And call that which is haram, halal. And you followed them and all of that. They say, yes, that is true. We did that. Because then, in that case, that is, your, that is you worshipping them. This is how you worship your rabbis and your monks. By following in legislation. By following in the rabbis and the monks making halal into haram and vice versa. So here, ibadah is linked directly to the process of legislation. In this verse. Right? Also, it is linked to Asma and Sifat, of course. أَفَغَيْرَ اللَّهِ يَبْتَغِي حَكَمًا وَهُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْكِتَابَ مُفَصَّلًا Shall I seek a hakam? Uh, Al-Hakam is one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shall I seek Al-Hakam other than Allah, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yet He is the one who has revealed the book? Explaining everything in detail. So here this verse and in Surah Al-An'am, verse 114, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He links Tawheed al-Hakimiyyah with, uh, 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 with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He mentions it as, uh, as, as related to Tawheed al-Hakimiyyah. Yes. 31. In the verse about اتخذوا أحبارهم ورهبانهم is Surah Tawbah, verse 31. Also, the Quran linked Tawheed al-Hakimiyyah directly to Iman. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ ذَلِكَ خَيْرٌ وَأَحْسَنُ تَأْوِيلًا They owe you who believe, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those who are in authority from amongst you فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ So if and when you disagree if and when you dispute في شيء in anything فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ Then refer it back to Allah and His Messenger. إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ If you really and truly believe in Allah. So that is the condition of Iman which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned. In other words, He say, if you really and truly believe in Allah, then refer all your matters to Allah and His Messenger. If you really and truly believe in Allah, then judge according to the book of Allah. So the judge, judging part is directly linked with if you really and truly believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how, this is a matter of not uh, fiqh, alaykum as wa not a matter of fiqh, not a matter of disagreement where uh, uh, differences are tolerated, it's a matter directly linked with iman. No, I'm, I'm, subhanAllah. Allah is saying, in the illallah, and they're saying that this is what the Khawarij used to say. Who said it first, Yaqi? The Khawarij or Allah? And this is, the, you know, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ You know, this is what the, the Khawarij perhaps used to say as well. You know, I mean, so you can bring many, all the deviant groups, they use this verse or that verse from the Qur'an to argue their case. Which is why the Qur'an, you know, some of it is obviously from the Muhkamat, and others of it is from the Mutashabihat. Some of which is clear cut and others, other verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is left in the Quran for people, the deviants, to, for them to pick up on and basically go astray. Right? So yes, all these deviant groups, they have a proof for the deviancy present in the Quran. All these deviant groups. What do we do? Shall we just nullify the whole Quran because one group or another is using the whole Quran for his, uh, you know, for their sake? Can't do that. It's a lame argument. It's a lame argument. Well, Allah is saying that. I and mean, you're telling me Khawarij is saying that. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, the, this is the... We can obviously, we can, we're going to go into reputation as well towards the end. But this is the basic thing you can respond to someone. Something as lame as that, you know. 
you know, subhanallah, who said it first? Allah is saying, hukm illa lillah. Is, it, is there anything wrong with saying that? Fine, what is it? If, we, if what we are saying is what the khawarij are saying, which is, for instance, takfir bil kabira, which is, uh, you know, uh, declaring a Muslim to be a kafir on account of major sins, then yes, you're right. If in that case we use this verse to say that whoever commits a major sin is a kafir, that's, you know, we will be khawarij if you're saying that. And may Allah protect us from uh, dalala. But are we saying that? No. What are we saying? We're saying that there are certain things, there are certain actions that are kufr. According to ijma of the scholars, and here's Sheikh bin Baz, and here's what Ibn Rasameen said, and this is what Shankiti said, and this is what Ahmad Shakir said. Are all these people khawarij? Not only that, I will, you know, I will give you quotes from Ahmad Shakir. His strong words, harsh words regarding people who try to make excuse for the rulers using the statements of Ibn Abbas. Who said this is, this is only kufr dun kufr. How harsh he was towards people who made excuses for the rulers using the words of Ibn Abbas. Because they are being used out of context completely. Um, but we'll get to that inshallah. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also links Al-Hukum bi ghira anzal Allah with kufr. Rather, Al-Hukum with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to Iman. So he says, Alam tara ila alladheena zi'umoon. أَنَّهُمْ آمَنُوا بِمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ Do you see these people who claim that they believe in what has been revealed to you and what has been revealed to those before you? يُرِيدُونَ أَنْ يَتَحَكَمُوا إِلَى الطَّهُورِ yeah, Despite of that, they claim to you that they believe in what has been revealed to you, O Muhammad. And they claim that they believe in everything else that has been revealed before you, yet still, يُرِيدُونَ أَنْ يَتَحَكَمُوا إِلَى الطَّهُورِ they still go to seek the judgment of Tahut. As we said, Tahut is anything that is worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything that is obeyed besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember the early definition of Tahut we gave. وَقَدْ أُمِرُوا أَنْ يَكْفُرُوا بِهِ While they have been ordered to reject faith in Tahut. They have been ordered to commit kufr in Tahut. وَيُرِيدُ الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ يُضِلَّهُمْ طَلَالًا بَعِيدًا And the shaytan would like to lead them Far, far astray. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again, He links Iman, with, or rather Tawheed, al hakimiyah with Iman. And also, Sorry? Which verse? I just, I just, uh, this was uh, An-Nisa 60 to 65. And the one before that that you mentioned? Again, 59. And Nisa 59. <coughs> also, there are many instances in the Quran where obedience to other than Allah has been described as kufr and shirk. Obedience to other than Allah is described as kufr and shirk. We're not talking about bowing down to idols. We're not talking about al halif bi Allah. We're not talking about you know another li Allah. We're not talking about vowing by other than Allah or, making, or praying to other than Allah. We're talking about obedience. Obedience to other than Allah is described as kufr and shirk. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا يُشْرِكُ فِي حُكْمِهِ أَحَدًا That He doesn't allow anyone to commit shirk in His hukum. Not in His ibadah, in His hukum. Right? So that's number one. So that's quite clear. Obviously that's Surah Al-Kahf and verse 26. Also, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَإِنْ أَطَعْتُمُوهُمْ إِنَّكُمْ لَمُشْرِكُونَ If you obey them, if you obey these pagans, if you obey these mushriks, then indeed you are a mushrik. If you obey them. Now what's the story? This is Surah Al-An'am, verse 121. What's the story behind this verse? وَإِنْ أَطَعْتُمُوهُ إِنَّكُمْ لَمُشْرِكُمْ It's to do with when they're offering their sacrifice if it's in a haram way, like it's just of Allah and Allah and if it's that meat and make them and it allows their ruling that is permissible then it is Yeah, basically the people in Jahiliyyah before Islam they used to eat maita What's maita? Dead animal. Dead. Mate. Mate is dead. 
Mm. Well, can't we? Well, you're supposed to eat like a live animal or something. What do you mean, dead animal? Obviously, when you slaughter an animal, it dies, and you eat the meat. <laughs> huh? You better bring it up, Sheikh Allah. Just everybody goes. No, 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 not necessarily. What is meta? What is meta? Rather than slaughtered. Already died. What if a person slaughters an animal? No, if a person actually does that, the zabh, live animal, a person is doing the zabh. But for other than Allah That's meta, is that, that's meta as well yeah. So meta is any meat The animal of which hasn't been slaughtered according to Sharia Yeah, and there's certain conditions obviously uh, From them that Allah's name has to be said At the time of slaughtering And the animal has to be alive While it is being slaughtered So if an, if an animal dies a natural death It's meta, it's dead animal That's it's called dead meat Okay or if it is slaughtered, but the person slaughters it for Jesus, for instance, or Muhammad, for instance, may Allah's peace and blessing be upon them, it is considered meta. Okay, even though he slaughtered it according to Sharia conditions, but he, he didn't fulfill one condition, which is that he did not slaughter it for the sake of Allah. He slaughtered it for other than Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So uh, let's keep the fiqh of slaughtering, because that's a it's a topic on its own, <laughs> especially in this country. Um, so, you know, so, so, so meta is anything which hasn't been slaughtered Islamically. But in this particular context, we're talking about animal which just drops dead, animal which dies a natural death. So, Mushrikeen at that time, they didn't find any problem with getting hold of this dead animal and skinning it, obviously, and cooking and eating it. Okay? For them, it wasn't a condition to actually slaughter, slaughter an animal and say the name of Allah, none of that. Animal dies, natural death, you pick it up and you eat it. That's, this was the part of their culture, their religion, whatever. So when the Prophet ﷺ, he came with Islam, he forbade them from eating maita. He forbade them from eating maita. Any animal which hasn't been slaughtered properly. Now, the mushrikeen at that time, they took an issue with that. And so they came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, You know, when an animal drops dead naturally, who kills it? And he said, well, Allah kills it. So the mushrikeen, they said to him that, Yet here you are, you know, preaching to us about Allah. When Allah kills an animal, you consider it haram. And yet, the animal which you kill yourself, you consider it halal. Are you then saying that you are better than Allah? That the animal that Allah kills is haram and the animal that you kill is halal? Are you better than Allah? And so in response Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, to the Prophet sallallahu that if you listen to them in that, that these shayateen obviously they whisper to each other to lead each other astray and if you listen to them, وَإِنْ أَطَعْتُمُوهُمْ إِنَّكُمْ لَمُشْرِكُونَ If you obey them in this, that is what? Making meta halal. If you make the meta halal, you are pagan just like them. You are a mushrik. And here, you know, the fear or uh, the person is not being called a mushrik because he's bound down to idols. He's not being called a mushrik because he slaughtered for other than Allah. He's not being called a mushrik because he made a vow to other than Allah. He's being called a mushrik because he followed the pagans in their legislation. Is there any proof more than that which we need to convince ourselves that really Hakimi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is twin half of faith of worshipping Allah alone as Shaykh Muhammad Ibrahim said. And that obedience to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shirk. So who can claim after that that Hakimiyyah is you know, a controversial issue Coined by these Islamists that came by the, you know, uh, by the da- after the downfall of Khilafah, uh, you know, that it's just a fiqhi issue and so on. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, Ada hukmul jahiliyat yabhun. Is it the hukm of jahiliyyah they're seeking? The hukm 
the pre-Islamic law, the pre-Islamic legislation. أَبَ حُكْمُ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ يَبْغُونَ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ مِنَ اللَّهِ حُكْمًا لِقَوْمِ يُقِنُونَ Is it that the ruling, the legislation of jahiliyyah they're seeking? And who is better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in hukum for a people who have true conviction? For a people who have true conviction. Now, we quote some of the scholars. One of the scholars, Al-Imam Muhammad Nasr al-Marwazi, he, one of the Imams of the Salaf, he did a sharh of hadith, uh, the hadith of Jibreel. And when the hadith says, وَأَن تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ In the sharh, on the commentary of وَرُسُلِهِ, he says, فَأَن تُؤْمِنَ بِمَنْ سَمَّ اللَّهِ That you, uh, you know, you believe in all the messengers, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned. Meaning belief in messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala implies that you believe in all the messengers which Allah has made mention of in his book. وَتُؤْمِنَ بِمُحَمَّدٍ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمُ And you believe in Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم وَإِمَانُكَ بِهِ غَيْرُ إِمَانِكَ بِسَائِرِ الرُّسُلُ That for you to believe in him is exactly like for you to believe in other prophets. Why? Because they added obligation. That we have towards the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Imanuka bisair rusul ikraruka bihim. For you to believe in the rest of the prophets is for you to acknowledge that they existed. Wa imanuka bi Muhammadin sallallahu alaihi wasallam ikraruka bihi wa tasdiquka iyyahu. That for you to believe in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam means for you to acknowledge that he existed. Obviously, that he is the Prophet of God. وَتَصْدِيقُ وَتَصْدِيقُ إِيَّاهُ That for you to acknowledge that he truly was uh, true in what he said. That he is the Prophet and the Messenger of God. And that whatever he came with is indeed the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, وَاتِّبَاعُكَ مَا جَاءَ بِهِ For you to follow everything he came with. فَإِذَا اتَّبَعْتَ مَا جَاءَ بِهِ أَدَّيْتَ الْفَرَائِضِ وَأَحْلَلْتَ الْحَلَالِ وَحَرَّمْتَ الْحَرَامِ That if you follow and if you do uh, if you follow what Allah what Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has come with and you offer all your obligations and you consider what that which he made halal to be halal and you also consider that which he made haram to be haram addayt al faraid wa ahlalt al halal wa haramt al haram okay you consider what he considered to be halal as halal and you consider what he considered to be haram as haram. وَوَقَفْتَ عِنْدَ الشُّبَهَاتِ وَسَعَرَاتَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ That you stop at you know, things that are of doubtful nature and you rush to do the good deeds. So that the shahid here is what? Is أَحْلَلْتَ الْحَلَالِ وَحَرَّمْتَ الْحَرَامِ That and this is considered to be part of your belief in the Prophet ﷺ. If he says that alcohol is haram to drink you believe there is haram to drink. You cannot legislate in a country that it is, ha- it is legal for people to consume alcohol. If you believe in the Prophet ﷺ. Al-Ith ibn Abdul Salam, rahimahullah, one of the scholars of Islam, uh, uh, he's also known as Sultan al-Ulama. He was known as a scholar who didn't fear anyone, who didn't fear any rulers. He was very upright. Uh, you know, and he didn't fear anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And obviously, he has many works on usul al fiqh in particular. He was a Shafi'i scholar of Ash'ari heritage, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but in terms of fiqh and usul, he is well celebrated. He said, وَتَفَرُّدُ الْإِلَاهِ بِالطَّاعَةِ لِاخْتِصَاسِهِ بِنِعَمِ الْإِنْشَاءِ وَالْإِبْقَاءِ وَالتَّغْذِيَةِ وَالْإِصْلَاحِ الدِّينِ وَالدُّنْيَوِي That, why is it? Why is it that we single out Allah with, with respect to ta'a? Why is it that we single out Allah with respect to obedience? That's because only He is the one who creates. He is the one who allows us to remain in this world. He is the one who sustains us. And He is the one who is responsible for our religious good and our worldly good. فَمَا مِنْ خَيْرٍ إِلَّا وَهُوَ جَالِبُهُ there is no good except that it comes from Him. 
وما من ضير إلا وهو سالبه and no harm that befalls us except that he is the one who takes it away from us he is the one who takes away the good things that we enjoy وليس بعض العباد بأن يكون مطاعا بأولى من البعض and you know a group of men are, have no preference over a group of other men they, they deserve no right to be obeyed his point is that all men are equal and no group of men deserve the right to have authority over another group of men so because why is لَيْسَ لِأَحَدِ مِنْهُمْ إِنْ عَمُمْ بِشَيْءٍ because none of the men are responsible for actually you know bestowing favors upon the rest of the humanities the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he bestows upon them life and all the gifts and uh, that, that we enjoy in this world so all these things is لَيْسَ لِأَحَدِ مِنْهُمْ إِنْ عَامٌ بِشَيْءٍ مِمَّا ذَكَرْتُهُ فِي حَقِّ الْإِلَهِ So none of these people are responsible for bestowing upon mankind what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows upon them وَكَذَلِكْ لَا حُكْمَ إِلَّا لَهُ And likewise, no one has the right for hukum, no one has the right for ruling and legislation except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala فَأَحْكَامُهُ مُسْتَفَادَةٌ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ وَالْإِجْمَاعِ so therefore his rulings, his laws are deduced from the kitab, from the book, the Qur'an, the sunnah, the ijma', the consensus of the Muslim scholars, وَلَقِيسَةِ sahiha and correct analogy, وَلِسْتِدْلَادِ المعتبرة and correct uh, deductions, فَلَيْسَ لِأَحَدٍ أَنْ يَسْتَحْسَنَ وَلَا أَنْ يَسْتَعْمِدَ لَمَصْلَحَةَ الْمُرْسَلَةِ So no one is therefore allowed to use istihsan and use Maslaha Mursala, obviously we wouldn't go to Istihsan and Maslaha Mursala at this stage, that's not the point of discussion here. But Istihsan for a person to deem something to be good in light of Sharia, in light of the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's saying that a person cannot even do that from his own accord. Deem something to be good and deem something to be bad. He cannot do that because that is Hukum bi ghir ma'anzal Allah. Al Isa ibn Abdul Salam is saying. So the point is, here is not about istihsan and maslaha mursala. The point here is that al-hukum bighir ma anzal Allah, al-iz ibn Abdul Salam, despite of being an Ash'ari scholar, he linked this directly to Iman. And in this respect, he is more of a Sunni than the Salafis in bulk. Even if he is, uh, you know, incorrect when, when it comes to uh, the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in this respect, he is indeed Spot on. Um, as far as the Tabari is concerned, he says in the tafsir of the verse, "Bala man aslama wajahu lillahi wa huwa muhsin." The Tabari, by the way, is one of the greatest tafsir scholars in the history of Islam. In the history of Islam, uh, especially when it comes to at tafsir bil ma'asur, tafsir of the Quran according to the narrations from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the Sahaba, the Tabi'un, and their followers. And that is the most comprehensive collection on Tafsir and Tafsir ibn Kathir is only an abridged version of Tafsir al-Tabari. So this is one of the best collections of Tafsir, yes. How many volumes is that? Tabari? Depends which print you buy, uh, the, the, the The best print of a Tabari as far as I'm aware is the one printed by Abdul Mah- Abdullah ibn Ahsan al-Turki in Saudi Arabia. I think that must be about 30 odd volumes. But that's really well researched, really good print. So, he says about this verse, بَلَا مَنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْهَهُ لِلَّهِ وَهُوَ مُحْسِنٌ That indeed, the one who surrenders to Allah, and he is a doer of good. So he says in the of the verse, مَنْ أَسْلَمَ وَجْهَهُ لِلَّهِ The one who surrenders to Allah. فَإِنَّهُ يَعْنِي بِإِسْلَامِ الْوَجْهِ التذلل لطاعته. What Allah means by Islam al-Wajh by, by a person surrendering himself to Allah is التذلل لطاعته. A person to completely submit himself to be completely submissive to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala والإذعان لأمره and likewise to completely obey whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders. This is Islam. This is what it means when a person surrenders to Allah. This is 
Imam al-Tabari explaining to us the meaning of Islam. وَأَصْلُ الْإِسْلَامِ الْإِسْتِسْلَامِ The root of the word Islam is al-istislam. لِأَنَّهُ لِأَنَّهُ مَنْ اسْتَسْلَمْتَ لِأَمْرِهِ Because it means that istislam means to completely surrender yourself. Completely surrender yourself to the will of someone else. What happens, obviously in a battlefield, if you're taken captive, you put your hands up and you surrender. So whatever your captive tells, captive tells you to do, you do it. He tells you to sit down, you sit down. He tells you to eat, you eat. This is what it means to surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَهُوَ الْقُضُوعِ In another word, he said, complete subjugation of oneself to Allah. وَإِنَّمَا سُمِّيَ الْمُسْلِمُ مُسْلِمًا بِخُضُوعِ جَوَارِحِهِ لِطَاعَةِ رَبِّهِ A Muslim is only called a Muslim because he subjugates his, in, his limbs to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why a Muslim is called a Muslim. And these are the words of Imam al-Tabari. إِنَّمَا سُمِّيَ الْمُسْلِمُ مُسْلِمًا بِخُضُوعِ جَوَارِحِهِ لِطَاعَةِ رَبِّهِ So this is what really Islam is. It's not merely about having a set of beliefs in your, in your heart, or having a set of like articles of faith you know, in a chart form hung up on the wall to be a good Muslim I have to believe in this and this and this and this and this and as long as I believe in this I'm a good Muslim that's not what Islam is about Islam is about Islam, about surrendering your body to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a person doesn't do that then he's not really truly a Muslim if a person refuses to surrender he's fighting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's what happens on a battlefield if a person refuses to surrender he is fighting, and most probably he will be shot. And this is what happens when a person doesn't refuse his surrender. There's a difference. I mean, it's a good um, analogy. You know, if a person is taken prison uh, as captive, there might be a few things he doesn't like, which his captors want him to do. So he doesn't do that. But generally, he is submissive to the will of the captors anyway. <coughs> but if a person completely rebels against his captors, he's no longer considered. A captive. He's considered a soldier who is continuing to fight. Yes. Like if for greed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran. Yes. Uh, but if you, you know, if you don't. If you don't stop for greed, then here, here, be notified of the war from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So there are certain things when a person, for instance, if he completely surrenders himself to Allah. Then there may be a few things where he disobeys him and sins, everyone commits sins. Right? But that isn't like a person who refuses to surrender himself to Allah altogether. Okay? So, um, here, uh, Sheikh bin Baz, he says, وَالْعُبُودِيَةُ لِلَّهِ وَحْدَهُ وَالْبَرَاءَةُ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الطَّاغُوتِ وَالْتَحَاكُمِ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ مُقْتَضَى شَهَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهِ that ubudiyah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and bara'a from worshipping ta'ud what does bara'a mean? bara'a disloyalty disloyalty not exactly hate it's one of the very Yeah, it's like free yourself. But you see, bara'a. Bara, it means, yes, free. But you see, in English, when you say, I'm free of you, meaning like, a right, man, you can do what you like, you know. And, uh, you know, you go do your business, I go do my business. But that's not what exactly it means in Arabic. It's like, um, a like you've got the other name for it, is, um, is it bara'a? No, that's uh, Tawbah. Tawbah. Surah Tawbah. Tawbah. Allah I'm sure it is because it's like freeing yourself from shirk so um Allah I, I think maybe maybe but Al-Bara'a is one of the names of Surah Tawbah yeah. so Al-Bara'a is uh, when a person not only frees himself but he says you know uh, it's, it's like it's like if you're in a country okay 
and you completely give up your citizenship. You have your passport, you put it on the, on the ground and you step on it. This is bara. It's like a, you know, this is, um, what do you call? Uh, this is a symbol. This is a gesture of bara. Meaning, you, you completely cut off any diplomatic ties with a person or with a body and you say, okay, there's just enmity between me and you. And there's no friendship, there's no loyalty, there's no allegiance. That's what bara'a means. Right? So here, when Shaykh ibn Abbas says, وَالْبَرَاءَ مِنْ عِبَادَةِ الطَّاهُودِ That's what he's referring to. Not just freeing himself, okay, that I don't do this, but in a sense that taking ibadat al-tahud, worshipping of anyone besides Allah, as what? As, uh, you know, as something that you turn to enemy to. وَالتَّحَاكُمْ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ مُقْتَلَى شَهَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ So, showing servitude to Allah and bara'a from worship of Tahud and seeking the ruling of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone seeking His legislation, seeking His law مِنْ مُقْتَلَى شَهَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ This is one of the things necessitated by our testimony of faith when we say لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ So, servitude to Allah and bara'a from ibadat al-tahut and tahakum to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone is from the necessities of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the Lord of all the people and their God, the one who is worshipped alone. وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَهُمْ He is the one who created them and He is the one who orders and He is the one who forbids. And he is the one who gives them life, and he is the one who gives them death. Well, he is the one who takes them to account, and he is the one who recompenses them. Well, who al duna kulli siwahu, and he is the one who is deserving of worship besides anybody else. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has said, "Ala lahu al khalq wal amr." Indeed, to Allah alone belongs al khalq. And Al-Amr Al-Khalq, creation Al-Amr, order To Allah alone belongs The act of creating And the act of ordering So if Allah is the one who creates He is the one who orders the creation What he wants to order It's not that Allah creates And someone else orders the creation how to live The one who creates is the one who orders the creation how to live فَكَمَا أَنَّهُ الْخَالِقُ وَحْدَهُ فَهُوَ الْآمِرُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَالْوَاجِبُ طَاعَةُ أَمْرِهِ So just as he is the only khaliq, just as he is the only creator, likewise he is the only one who has the right to order, and is the only one who has the right to be obeyed in his order. وَقَدْ حَكَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْيَهُودِي أَنَّهُمْ اتَّخَذُوا أَحْبَارَهُمْ وَرُهْبَانَهُمْ أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ And surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already informed us about the Yahud that they took their rabbis and their monks as lords besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, the point of all this is what? The point of this is Tawheed al-Hakimiyyah is deeply related to and it is linked with the asl of our faith, the very foundation of our faith. A Muslim, a person becomes a Muslim by believing in this and a person becomes a kafir by rejecting this. This is how fundamental it is. So, here, the Shaykh says, وَالْمُهِمْ هُنَا إِذْرَاكُوا أَنَّ الْكَلَامَ فِي هَذِي الْمَسْأَلَ لَيْسَ تَدْخِيمًا لِقَضِيَةٍ جُزْئِيَّةٍ Now when we speak about this issue, we're not trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. كَمَا قَدْ يَدْعِي الْبَعْضِ As he says, some people, as talking about in the Middle East, obviously when this book was published, that was, you know, more than a decade ago, perhaps. That as some people claim that you know you just people talking about these issues just making a mountain out of a molehill. مِمَّنْ يَظُنُّ أَنَّ كَسَرَ الْكَلَامِ فِي مَسَلَةٍ مِنْ فِي مَسَلَةٍ وَجُوبُ التَّحَكُّمِ إِلَى شَرْعِ اللَّهِ إِنَّمَا نَشَأَ مِنَ الظُّرُوفِ السِّيَاسِيَةِ وَالدَّعْوِيَةِ لِلْحَرَكَاتِ الْإِسْلَامِيَةِ. A lot of people in the Middle East and countries they think oh this is like it's just a you know just a new topic to discuss and it's usually coined the whole Hakimiyah phrase is being coined by people either in Egypt like Sayyid Qutb and Hassan Banna or people in uh, India and Pakistan like Maududi who just wanted to oppose the political apparatus in function in Muslim countries and 
And in order to achieve that end, in order to uh, attach a religious significance to the opposition movement to the government, they coin the Hakimiya phrase. So he is refuting that because that is not the case. As we have seen, Hakimiya is to do with the very foundation of our faith. Yes. I would say about some massage that say they have to be bribed as obedient citizens of the country and you have to follow the law and everything I would say and things like that. Like Lewisham, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> Do we tell people to go and break laws and, no, you know, no, no, no. don't obey the traffic lights. <laughs> If you see an old woman crossing the street, you must run over her. No, we don't say that. Yes. <laughs> we also say, you know, that you have to obey the laws of the country, um, you know, so long as they're, they're not in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if they are, then you see, this is something that for if you do it, you will get, you will incur a penalty for it, prison sentence, money, whatever. If it is, then it's a case of really, um, you know, a darura, in which case you have to obey the law, otherwise you'll be penalized. So, uh, like insurance, driving without insurance, insurance is haram. But I wouldn't recommend anyone drive without insurance because, you know, if, if let's say the government becomes lax on car insurance, such that you can get away with it without having to pay, you know, hefty penalty, then yeah, I would say, I would suggest yeah, get away with insurance if you can. Now, if you can't. And it's better not to put yourself in, in, in trouble. So, it's, for here, as far as we're concerned, it's not a matter of choice. It's a matter of compulsion. You don't have a choice. So, the question doesn't arise, shall we obey the law, shall we not? Well, you have a choice. You have to obey the law. What can you do? Okay? Yes? I want just to, you know, recall the, uh, the, the example that you, you, you know, gave last time with the communists. Yes. And you said that the communists, he, he, he can live in a, in, a, in a social society or something like that, but you have to hate you, know, you hate the system, but it doesn't yeah. mean that you cannot live in society. Yeah. Uh, plus, not everything, you see, not everything in the system is bad. Um, there are many things. As we uh, come to the end of it, inshallah, because there, there's, there's all the other extreme as well when it comes to Hakimiya, where any sort of legislation is considered shirk. Even something as traffic lights, as I said, is considered shirk. Or something as, uh, you know, like congestion charges is considered shirk. Oh, that's not something that Allah has revealed in the Quran. How dare you charge people five pounds or ten pounds for entering the congestion charge area? Some people think that way. But obviously that, that's a misconception that needs to be cleared up. So, when we say that, you know, a person dislikes in his heart things that are in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what we mean by that is that, you know, that that's the, obviously that is the weakest level of faith. That doesn't just apply to the, ro- the laws that you see. It applies to a person, for instance, walking down the street drinking. It's something you dislike. Naturally, you're supposed to dislike. If you hear about a person is, you know, is a pedophile, it's something you dislike. If you hear about a person is going to rob a place, for instance, it's something you dislike in his heart and you hate him for that sake. Right? Likewise, there are many laws in this country that are opposed to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you have to dislike those, those laws even if it means you must obey them uh, in order to save yourself from uh, you know, receiving a penalty even if it means you have to obey them but if you were given a choice if you were given a choice in many cases you know you're given a choice where there's a dispute between yourself and a brother you have a choice of not taking this case to the court no one is compelling you to go to the court and bring this brother in and do the hakam to tahut. No one is asking you to do that. So if you do, uh, if you take this brother to the court, you know, and you seek the judgment of tahut, then of course you are guilty. But if that's something which you can opt out. But there are other things where you can't opt out, and that's beyond the question of can I or can I not. You have to. Oh, this is a good question. So, so would you say it's sinful? For a Muslim to be living under these laws, even though they may have the money to make his money. Because where this, um, these laws are corrupt, because they do allow a lot of things that are haram. 
No, in principle. But I'm just saying, if the if the um the individual does have money to make his wealth, and he just wants to settle it, it's not just for dawah purposes, but he just wants to settle and live there. I mean, you know, there's so many people I came across in Saudi. Mm. Yeah, I wish I had the money and the means to smuggle them into the UK, just so that they can live here, not give dawah, because the sort of life they're living in Saudi, not even an animal I would envisage a life uh, that sort of life for. Uh, so I think Hijrah is a topic on its own. It's a topic on its own. And many of the brothers in this country, they're just basically part of a process in which, in which they treat like guinea pigs. They are just experimenting with themselves and their lives and their families. Only to go and live in these countries for 10 years and come back. And to build their lives from the scratch. So Hijrah is a topic on its own. And as far as living under, you know, Islamic countries, comes, I mean, a, a country which rules according to Sharia 100%, where would you find that country? In Saudi Arabia, you can't have a car without insurance anymore. You have to have insurance. And not only that, in Saudi Arabia, for obviously they have riba banks and everything, if you borrow a riba we loan, in Saudi Arabia that is, by the way, if you borrow a riba we loan from a company, and that company, let's say, uh, you know, you, you borrow the loan and you don't want to give the money back. The company can't take you to the Sharia court. The Sharia courts don't deal with riba. So what they have set up in Saudi, basically, laws parallel to Sharia courts to deal with, uh, basically, banks that give out riba to people. So they have law, they have courts. Parallel to Sharia courts that are just set up in Saudi Arabia, just for hukum the ghirma under Allah. So, wherever you go, wherever you go, you will face this problem, which is why it's just a controversial issue, because it's such a prevailing issue, on, on, you know, and it's, the problem is only getting worse, it's not getting better. At least for Saudi Arabia, anyway. Yes. You know, it's, it's a useless question to say, what do the scholars say about it? You know why? Because, really and truly, uh, there are so many controversial issues today that most of the people do not feel easy talking about them. Okay? So even if you had a ruler in Saudi Arabia, and, uh, sorry, not ruler, but you even had a scholar in Saudi Arabia, and there are many like, not a scholars in Saudi Arabia, I mean, you find some scholars who actually believe electricity, everything is bidah. And this particular scholar, he has a donkey to ride on. He doesn't wear a watch. Okay? But you will find all these people, and most probably if you sit in their private circles, they'll tell you all about the, which prince is kafir and which person, person is Muslim. They'll tell you, but the society doesn't allow people to speak freely. The society doesn't allow people to speak their minds. So how can we ever determine what a scholar actually believes or he doesn't believe. It's just futile. As I said, carrying out a poll in a country like Saudi Arabia, what do you think about the ruling family? <laughs> you can't have honest people giving honest opinion. Impossible. I mean, it doesn't have to be only because of the government. Sometimes, you know, the issue of, for instance, copyright. Contra- another controversial issue. Some scholars, uh, obviously, they, they say that Copy, there is no concept of intellectual property in Islam and hence there is no such thing as copyright okay and many other scholars they believe that there is copyright and you know even if it's not some intellectual property what you say what you write it's not something you can hold in the hands not something tangible it still does have a value you can have your company name and get it registered and it has a value for instance so we have a group of scholars but the scholars who oppose copyright are always few in number. Because you can imagine the palaver all cause. If a, if a scholar were to get up and say, there's no copyright. Of course he can copy Windows Vista. Of course he can copy all these books. Yeah, loot and, you know, copy and mass produce all these works. No problem, it's all halal. It'll be very controversial. It'll be very, it will, it will, people, society will deem it unethical. It's got nothing to do with the rulers. It's just a certain opinion 
are considered taboo in the society in which we live. And because of the controversy and because of lack of open and free debate about these issues, it's very difficult to determine what scholars really believe in many of these issues. But uh, having said that, you know, a person should not take a position in which he has no imam. Okay? It's not sufficient to say, well, the scholars are never going to say this, so let me take a precedence and give a ruling. It's very important that people do not do this. As Imam Ahmad said, beware of coming up with an opinion. Beware of saying something in which you have no imam. When a person wants to, you know, he wants to air his opinion, he must make sure that, okay, I have such a scholar who's actually backing me in this opinion. So I'm not actually innovating, inventing something, inventing a third opinion. You know, if the scholars would disagree over an issue into two camps, and you create a third opinion, and that's something like something like that. It's not permissible. Yeah. So. Yes. I'm just thinking about again this migration stuff, and you said that thing about the ayah you know, that Allah says that um, you know when people they will complain about because they were weak, and Allah answered them. Yes. Yes, I mean, again, again, this is a whole topic, we're going to cover that in Hijrah, inshallah. It's going to be a whole topic on, there's going to be a whole topic on Hijrah. So, uh, I mean, yeah, this verse is obviously talking about people in Makkah who were ordered to migrate. They were ordered to migrate. And they chose to remain behind in Makkah. They didn't... Uh, stick with this, the Islamic movement at the time which was transferring its base obviously from Makkah to Medina so they were obviously at fault for not migrating with the Prophet Sallallahu but we're talking about obviously when a person loses his faith instead of migrating then yes this ayah is applicable but the reason for migration itself if we compare to our reasons for migration and the reason for which the Prophet and his companions migrated are completely different. Most of the people today who want to migrate is because the life is difficult. You can't uh, go out on the street without being called Bin Ladens. And you know, the, 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 the women uh, of their families are abused on the street and so on and so forth. So they want to go and live a sheltered life in a Muslim country where they're not abused and they just leave, live very peacefully. Okay? This wasn't the mentality of the companions. This isn't the reason for which they migrated. They migrated because they wanted to be part of a movement. They migrated to be with the Prophet ﷺ and give him bayah on jihad and hijrah. Because they wanted to be with him and to be part of their struggle. They didn't want to go to, to a country and just live uh, their life you know, uh, with uh, uh, all happiness and peace and without any struggle and without any tribulation. There's something to consider is that, you know, why did the Prophet ﷺ send the first group of the Muslims to Abyssinia? But he didn't go himself. He chose to remain in Mecca where he was being abused and the rest of his companions. And, you know, he was facing all the hardship and trouble head on. He could have also left Mecca and he'd probably be well received. In Habasha, but he didn't. Because their mindset was different. The migration, jihad, da'wah, everything was for a higher purpose, for a superior purpose. People didn't migrate so they can live a better life in Medina. They migrated so they can fight alongside the Prophet and die. That's why they migrated. So, I'm not going to exhaust the, the conversation. Sure, sure. So, because to my understanding of what I've come across when I've read books, and I thought that the reason why he made, why he moved from Mecca to Medina was because that he was suffering severe persecution in Mecca. So this was, this is what I thought that initiated the first um, reason why he went to Medina. Now, that, this is definitely one of the reasons yeah, because, why didn't he yeah. Um, jihad in Mecca and Medina? I mean, in Mecca rather than. Well, it was practically impossible for him to sell the jihad at that time anyway. Okay? Yes, one of the reasons he left Makkah was that Makkah was an infertile ground at that time and Makkans were hostile towards him, definitely. 
But that wasn't the only reason. You see, that wasn't the only reason which, uh, you know, which, which got this whole Hijrah thing started. As I said, if that was the only reason, he could have gone to Habisha, but he didn't. Because when he, um, he got help from the Ansar, isn't he? Yes. So therefore he made alliance with um, them when he went over there to help. Exactly. He so it was in the interest of the movement. Yeah. It wasn't his own personal interest that I will have a, a, I will be assured safety in Habasha. So let me make Hijrah to Habasha for personal safety. He made Hijrah to Medina in interest of the wider movement. He said they are the Ansar, and they are willing to help this movement. So let's go over there. You see, so that was a wider. His interest of Hijrah was a, is a wider interest, and not personal interest. Whereas most of us, we seem to have a personal interest at heart. We, when we make Hijrah, we don't actually make Hijrah to go be part of a movement, to be part of a bigger picture. We just want to make Hijrah to a place where we are not abused, and we can ironically spread the English culture over there in Muslim countries by teaching English, because that's the only way of earning income in Muslim countries anyway. Nothing that I used to do, <laughs> unfortunately, in Mecca. You know, but that's, that's, that's what you do, and that's the, that's the hypocritical thing about it. There you are, in Makkah, teaching people English, and taking pride in your values which you've been brought up in this country. I mean, you're teaching these people, these Bedouins, to say please and to say sorry. Where do you think it's from? It's from this country. So, <laughs> you know, so it, it's, it's, it's really what, what, when you see what you're actually doing, you're actually going out there, and you're just working for the British Council for free. It's just... I do understand what you're saying, but th- I could understand why people make Hijrah as well, so they can practice their religion a bit more, and not be surrounded by... You know, but that's the thing, their understanding of practicing religion mm-hmm. is very limited, isn't it? Their understanding of practicing religion is basically hearing the Adhan, and going to the mosque. Mm-hmm. Full stop. You see? Practicing a religion, so the Sahaba was... They are... On death, bay on jihad, bay on hijrah. That was their understanding of practicing religion. Our understanding is completely different. You see, our understanding is basically having, living in a bubble and having a nice time while we uh, while we enjoy this life. You know. Is it classified as, as a hijra? I mean, what is that? No, no, I mean, I, I, I'm not talking about classification. Is it classified as hijra or not? You know, really, you know, uh, whoever ma- makes hijra for Allah's sake and his messenger's sake and his hijra is for their sake. And whoever makes hijra for, you know, to marry a woman, then his hijra is for that sake. The hijra is still hijra. But how much of the ajr he will get? Allahu alam. But, you know, hijra is a different topic, inshallah. We'll discuss in detail. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing. I mean, that's one thing. I wouldn't say people don't have choice. I say people, they just you know, uh, if they were really organized in France, they can have a you know, mass civil disobedience, for instance, and demand their rights. And France, by the way, isn't the first country to impose something like that. Remember that happened in Turkey. Yeah? Women were... It was forbidden on women to practice a veil, to wear hijab in Turkey when Adhan took over. Not only that, Arabic script was completely... They got rid of it. They replaced it with, uh, you know... The, the Roman script and uh, even the Adhan were turned into Turkish everything was just turned into Turkish, <laughs> Turkish language ok huh? so, so the point is what happened at that time yes many people they left Turkey oh sorry did I upset any uh, uh, Turkish brothers here <laughs> I was going to say that it was reciting the translation of the Quran so they were actually reciting the translation of the Quran in Turkish as if they were reciting the Quran. But it happened. Of course not, of course not. But, you see, it, it happened. And not only that, you see, France is just one minority. 
We have so many minorities in, in the whole world. Burmese Muslims for instance, they're not even allowed to have Muslim names. Yeah? If you're talking about, for instance, if you're talking about a group of 100, 200 Muslims living in isolation on an island where they're being oppressed, yes, buy a ticket and get lost. But if you're talking about a population as big, that in millions, six billion in France, you can't just tell them all to leave. The solution for them is civil rights. The solution for them is going out on the streets and demanding their rights. Solution for them, because they, they're not, they're not going to, people, population as humongous as that is not going to get up and leave. Which is why we have minorities still living in oppression in Burma, in Thailand, in other, other places, in the Philippines, so many other countless places we've never even heard of. I mean, how many people died in Bosnia? 100,000 something like that. Okay. Why couldn't they just made hijrah? I mean, can anyone in his right mind think these people actually wanted to be slaughtered? Uh, instead of, you know, because when you're talking about such a huge number, 100,000, you cannot just relocate them on map just like that. So when it comes to the crunch, they will die. But you can't just relocate them on a map. You're talking about huge populations. I mean, when Stalin came to power, what did he do with the Muslims, you know, in Chechnya? He sent them to Siberia. The whole village, the whole Muslim, not village, the whole city, was ordered to leave and walk all the way to Siberia because they, they were responsible for treason against the communist state at that time. The whole city was ordered to leave, all the Muslims were ordered to leave the city and move to Siberia. Did it happen? No. Only half the city managed to leave. And the, the half that left, half of them actually died on the way. And very few people actually reached Siberia. That's what, you can't relocate a huge number of people on the map so easily. So we're talking about practical solutions. And just giving a fatwa to all the people of France, well, they've called niqab haram now in the legislation, so you have to leave. That is not a solution for them. Solution for them is helping them out, you know, speaking on their behalf, bringing their, uh, you know, struggle to the fore, telling the world, you know, what they're ex- ex- experiment or what they're experiencing over there is not just and so on. That's the practical solution. <coughs> what do you say about well, a masjid that actually ba- banned a brother and took him to court? I was the ruling on them that took him to court and the Kupar law because they said that it's haram to become a policeman, to become a, a police a soldier in the army and things like that. I think this mosque about, I think he spent about 30,000 pounds to ban a brother <laughs> from a mosque. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, subhanAllah, may Allah guide them, really, what can he say? Question about Hakimiya. Yes. Uh, is, is there any specific environment, or I mean, do we need a specific or particular environment before starting the implementation of Sharia or Hakimiya? That's another, uh, like, a, you know, another, like a dilemma as to that many of the Islamists face is that if ever we do get the opportunity, to implement Islam, do we do it gradually? Or do we do everything just in one go? How does it happen? Uh, that, that's a dilemma. The, again, you know, when as many go beyond sloganeering, the practicalities of bringing in Islamic law, practicalities of getting rid of the paper money and bringing back gold and silver, a lot of that, you know, get, gets into like. Uh, you know, a dilemma. It's a dilemma. I don't think I would have answers to that. I don't think many people have answers to that. I don't think there's, I mean, there's any place right now I can think of which is you know, safe for you to go and you know, participate and stuff. I wouldn't advise anyone to leave. Uh, I mean, as I said, Hijrah is a different topic altogether. 
you know, it's, it's more a matter of, you know, where do we make... It's not, the question isn't, where do we make hijrah? The question is, what do we do with our lives? Hijrah is a means, not an objective. Yeah? What am I doing? What are my potentials? What are my, you know, my, my abilities? And how can I help Islam? And if it requires hijrah, I'll make hijrah. If it doesn't require hijrah, I won't make hijrah. You see, it's a matter of... It's a matter of being part of a bigger picture. Being part of a bigger struggle. And how you, and you fit into this puzzle. Once you realize that, then you determine, okay, do I need to make hijrah for this? It may be that you're needed in some place, some country, because you have certain skills. And for that, it may even be wajib for you to make hijrah. To help these people. But you see, you're helping, you're making hijrah for a greater reason. Hijrah is like a vehicle that's taking you to your objective. It's not the objective in and of itself. So could we, Sorry. Um, it's not to happen that I was on YouTube once and I was on this to my school lecture on New Salafia. And then I, I, came, I came across another link that said, I replied.